Let's go back to our breaking news this hour and that decision by the Labour Party conference to make it party policy to, in effect, abolish private schools. And we're joined from the conference in Brighton by the Shadow Education Secretary, Angela Rayner. Um, Ms Rayner, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, this motion, I assume that you voted in favour of it. Well, what we are very clear on in the Labour Party is we want to end a two-tier system that allows privilege to overtake actual academic, um, um, what they're able to achieve as young people. We know that 7% of the population cream off the best jobs just because they went to private school and that the state currently subsidises that. Well, we don't want that anymore. We don't think it's fair. And we're going to create a comprehensive national education service. These schools, um, they are places of excellence, though, academic excellence, aren't they? Well, what they do, actually, is they buy privilege and we subsidise it through, you know, the tax breaks, through charitable status and through business rate relief. And we said, why should we do that? That's not fair. We've set up a social justice commission that will look at this in great detail and how we integrate and create a fully comprehensive national education service, which means that every child will have the best education and the best start. Because at the moment, it's not based on people's academic ability. It's based on your parents' ability to pay and to cream off the privilege and the elitism that we see that has been borne out by people like David Cameron and Boris Johnson who have wrecked our economy and ruined our country and we don't want that anymore we want actually everybody to do well based upon their academia what do you say to the students who've been to these schools who've worked extremely hard who've got the top grades and say that it's their academic performance and not to any sense of privilege that's got them through They'll do extremely well in the National Education Service because that means that there'll be a level playing field where everyone can do well and those pupils that want to achieve can achieve in our National Education Service. At the moment, um, the current system is based on privilege and elitism and we've got to stop that. In the 21st century, in global Britain, we've got to make sure that every single young person in our country can do well and therefore we cannot continue to have this two-tiered system where the taxpayers are subsidising the 7% who manage to go to these private schools. We're going to end that. So it's really just about punishing the rich, isn't it? Is it class war you're talking about? It's about making sure that we have a fully integrated national education service. We want to make sure that every child has the best opportunity because that's the best for our economy going forward. Mm. We know why that we need on... to... Mm. Why don't you focus on pushing up standards? We are very concerned with pushing up standards and that's why we also announced today our announcement on Ofsted that we would reform the current system of looking at schools because we want to make sure that we measure schools based upon their success and their excellence. We're losing teachers at record levels, we've got class sizes increasing and under the National Education Service our schools will be funded, our teachers will be empowered in the classroom and our children will get the best start in life where they can get free at the point of use education when they need it and that will and build the will... schools for our country. How will doing away with private schools help all of that? Well, we're stopping the tax breaks to these private schools and we'll end the two-tiered system that we currently have because this system at the moment is based on privilege and elitism. We see that, whether it's through jobs with the CEO, the top executives, whether that's through Parliament. I've seen more posh Tory school private boys than I've ever seen in my life since I've become a Member of Parliament. And that doesn't reflect the cities and the towns across the UK. We need to make sure that every child, no matter where they're born in the UK and to what family, they will get the best opportunity. And under Labour, that's what we will deliver. What about the Labour Party um, in your shadow cabinet? Did any of them go to private school? Well, I don't know how many did go to private school or not, but I'm interested in making sure that the young people across this country get those opportunities. Because what I can tell you is a girl that came from a comprehensive school that was pregnant at 16 and was told I wasn't going to amount to anything, my Labour Party have given me opportunities. But I want to make sure instead of the social mobility that plucks a lucky few like me, we'll have a social justice commission that makes sure that everyone, including the people I grew up with, gets the opportunities to do well in life. That's the difference between Labour and the Tories. Mm. Um, you know, you speak of a 21st century global Britain, um, but these are centuries old in some cases institutions um, that are renowned around the world. And we'll have a national education service, which will be the envy of the world. And we'll welcome that. We'll still be internationalist about it. But we'll also make sure that our system is fair and is accessible to all so that we can truly make sure that the people who are in the top jobs of our country are actually competent to do that job and don't lead us into chaotic Brexit deals like Boris Johnson wants to do and actually looks at the evidence and delivers us a country that we can all be proud of. Mm. Let's go back to education. Um, in this um, motion, it said that endowments, investments and properties held by private schools will be redistributed democratically and fairly across the country's educational institute, um, institutions. Isn't it illegal to strip a charity of its assets? 
Well, one of the things that I set out in my speech today is that we'd look at the Social Justice Commission, and that would be one of the first tasks that me and John McDonnell as the Treasury will look at ensuring that what we have to do is abide by the law and make sure that we do things appropriately, and we will do that. I, every step that I've taken for the National Education Service has been a responsible one based on evidence, and we'll continue to do that. But let's be clear, the Labour Party, the Labour Party wants to see an integrated National Education Service and stop the creaming off and the state subsidy for private schools, because that doesn't help anybody. So you must have looked into this um, in writing this motion. How are you legally going to do that then? Well, I didn't write the motion. The motion comes from uh, our many affiliates and from our branches across the UK. You must have UK. seen it before. Had... How are you going to legally um... do that? And we've had a fantastic debate. We've debated the academisation, the fact that we've got multi-academy trusts where the CEOs are creaming off the most money, more than what the Prime Minister is on. We want to stop this gaming in the system and we want to create a comprehensive state education system that truly reflects the UK of today and gives everyone opportunity. And that's yeah, what how, we're going to look at. Sorry, to, sorry to, to ask the question for a third time. Um, how are you legally going to do that? Well, we've said that we would set up a social justice commission that would look into these issues on how we can take those, those processes forward. But we've been absolutely clear, and I am absolutely clear, that in my speech we will end the subsidies to these private schools and we will look at how we can integrate to create one national education service. And I think that's the important news today, is that people who are watching your show can know and have the confidence that their child will get the best education under Labour. And it will not be a system that protects the elite at the top at the expense of their young person. Some would also argue that you're also going to end um, aspiring middle-class parents who just want the best for their children and who want them to go to these schools. Well, I think any parent, actually, regardless of their class in the country, want to see their children do the best. And to be honest, as a corporate parent, as the Secretary of State for Education, I can't afford to let any child be left behind because we need an economy that works for everyone, and that means that everyone's skills should be valued. We need the craftsmen and women. We need um, electricians. We need plumbers. We need vocation. And we need the academic qualifications as well. Our National Education Service will deliver that. I'm confident that our National Education Service will give every child the best possible start in life because that's good for our economy as well as being good for parents. OK, Ms. Farina, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you. Well, joining me live from the Labour Conference in Brighton is Julie Robinson, Chief Executive of the Independent Schools Council. Uh, that's the body which represents private schools. A very good evening. Thank you for being with us. So was this uh, something of a surprise or did you see it coming? Yes, we knew from the last Labour manifesto that VAT was likely to be levied on school fees, but this move towards abolition of private schools is quite a shock to the sector because, of course, it would do damage to the state system. Doing away with independent schools won't help state education. It'll put extra pressure on the system to find places for another 600,000 pupils at a time when budgets are already stretched in the state sector. Uh, there'll be millions of, of uh, parents around the country who will be applauding this, parents who can't afford to send their children to private schools. Well, you may say that, but the way that the sector has been characterised, um, and in your piece just now, Angela Rayner was talking about uh, Etonian prime ministers, a lot has been made of that, but that's not a correct characterisation of our sector. There are parents around the country who are not high-earning parents, and the kinds of schools that are more typical in our sector are just small community schools, they're local employers, and they're accessible to a whole range of parents. The sector is not as it's been portrayed at the conference today. Yeah, but this isn't just about uh, Eton and Harrow, this is about all private schools, isn't it? And uh, you say that uh, the private sector is open to, to many parents, but it simply isn't true. Only 1% of pupils at private schools have a free place. Well, actually, it's interesting that you mention Eton and Harrow because the ISC represents 1,300 schools and they are a whole lot more accessible than they're given credit for. We're involved in places for looked-after children and bursaries and a third of children at ISC schools are on reduced fees. It's far, far more accessible than it's given credit for. Yeah, but reduced fees, 10% uh, off, 15% off, whatever it may be, uh, is still uh, a drop in the ocean scale, when you're paying fees of £6,000 a term. Um, Schools, well, the, the, the average actually is, is not as much as that, but schools around the country are building their bursary provision. So this year it's up 6% on last year. Over a million pounds a day is spent on bursary provision. And for schools who can't afford that, because remember, they are privately run, other schools do other things for the community. So our schools are already integrated in society through groups of schools, where there are some state and some independent schools working together, through teacher training schemes, and through lots of mutually positive partnership schemes across the country. Independent schools are not alien to the rest of the education sector, they're part of it, and we should be working together for all children. 
Why should taxpayers who can't afford to send their children to private schools, such as the ones you've talked about, why should they subsidise those that can afford it, charitable status, not paying VAT on fees, etc? Well, that's what's interesting. Actually, at the moment, there's less subsidy than there would be under this Labour plan, because what Labour suggests doing is moving 600,000 600, children into the state system where they would be paid for by the taxpayer. At the moment, they save the taxpayer £3.5 billion a year, and they provide £14 billion to GDP. So these schools are already giving much, much more than they take away. Well, we've talked a little bit about Eton. Uh, Eton College's annual accounts uh, last year show that they have 200 properties and have endowments and investments worth more than £400 million. If Labour's policy goes through, if they win the election, then that £400 million at just one school will be spread fairly across the whole education system. That's got to be a good thing. I think you'll find there are various legal barriers to just seizing the assets of Eton College. And let's remember that Eton has over 90 children on bursary places, free places, disadvantaged children. It does a lot of good. But again, it's important to remember there's only one Eton. I ran an independent prep school. We didn't have those kinds of resources. We ran a very small surplus each year and we were extremely accessible. We were part of the local community. We were joined up with ordinary people. But, but what does that actually mean? Does it mean state school pupils being able to use the, the playing fields occasionally or being able to use the drama studio from time to time? Well, schools which are charities are duty-bound to demonstrate their public benefit, and they can do that in a range of ways. Yes, they can do it by sharing facilities, but, you know, only half of independent schools have got swimming pools, for instance. So independent schools are simply not like the big schools that you can name that you're imagining. So some of them just don't have great facilities. I know an independent school that borrows a local academy school swimming pool because they don't have as yeah, good how many, facilities. How many, you're using the example of, of swimming pools. That only half of private schools have swimming pools. I mean, how many state schools have the luxury of a swimming pool? Well, this is where we have to work together across the entire system. OK. Um, there's no doubt about it, though. Children who go to fee-paying schools do have a disproportionate chance of succeeding in life, don't they, over those who go to the, uh, the state sector? Well, it depends what research you look at. In fact, Sutton Trust Research and Education Policy Institute research shows us that across the state system itself, there's a 500-year uh, disadvantage gap. There's an enormous difference. So let's look at this Labour policy. If they abolish independent schools, where will the parents put those pupils? They'll put them in good state schools. They'll move into catchment areas where there's already a premium of at least £100,000 to live in the catchment area of that good state school. It will create more um, social disparity across the state system. So it, it'll make social wait, wait, mobility wait, wait, actually wait. worse. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but surely if you're in a situation where your children are going to a private school because you can afford it and you're motivated and you want your kids to have that sort of education, rather than sending them to the local comp, if everyone has to send them to the local comp, then surely that school's standards are going to go up and improve. No, we know already because of the way the grammar system works, because of the way um, parents with means can pay for private tuition to get their children into the more selective schools, we know that there's a premium within and across the state system as well. So to send your child to certain state schools with the housing premium you have to pay to be in that catchment area can cost more than it would have cost in private school fees to a mid-range independent school. So there's already this disparity. What we have to remember is it's not schools who have created social inequality. It's not schools who are to blame. And there are plenty of different factors contributing to economic and social inequality across the country. Independent schools want to do their bit. They want to create more bursaries to be involved with looked after children's schemes and partnerships. And they want to be part of the overall system to be part of the solution of this problem. Tearing us down will make things worse for everyone. OK, I mean, you mentioned the Sutton Trust research uh, a little bit earlier. I've, I've got it here, actually. 7% um, of pupils in England are educated in private school, uh, we know. But the Sutton Trust showed that privately educated alumni made up 39% of the Cabinet, 59% uh, of permanent secretaries in the civil service, and two-thirds of uh, senior judges. Um, if you go to private school, you're going to do better in life. It's as simple as that. Well, that's right. That is what the Sutton Trust research finds, but that's based on 30 to 40 years ago. So that was a time when we had direct grant grammar um, education, and it was different then. These days, we are much, much more diverse. Opportunities are given to a, a broader range of people. We are becoming a more equal society, and independent schools are doing their bit towards that. OK, we really appreciate your time. Julie Robinson, Chief Executive of the Independent Schools Council, uh, many thanks. Thank you.